Hi, and welcome once again. Today we are going to look at antibodies. And when we say antibodies, these are also known as immunoglobulins. And these are glycoproteins which are produced by the plasma cells of the white blood cells. Now, by glycoproteins, glyco from carbohydrates and proteins. And so through the process of glycosylation, the carbohydrates are attached to the proteins and they form the antibodies. Now we have five main classes or isotopes of these human antibodies or immunoglobulins. We have immunoglobulin J, M, A, D, and E. Now the main function of these immunoglobulins are to help identify and neutralize disease-causing agents such as bacteria and viruses. It's also important for us to note that all antibodies are immunoglobulins, but all immunoglobulins are not antibodies. We shall delve deep into what antibodies are. Now, on this image, we have the antibodies, how they look like. And so, the simplest antibodies such as immunoglobulin D, E, and G are known as monomers. And these monomers are having Y-shaped macromolecules. They are monomers, and so they are composed of four glycoprotein chains. These four glycoprotein chains, you can find them as two identical heavy chains. Then also we have two identical light chains. Now, the two tips of the Y monomer are referred to as the antigen binding sites or the fab portion or domain of the antibody. And these portions provide specificity for binding of an antigen. Now, the FC uh, domain or the FC portion of the antibody becomes biologically active only after the antigen binding site has bound to its corresponding antigen. And so biological activities which needs to take place include activating of complement pathways, also binding to receptors uh, on phagocytes, and also you know other defense cells to promote the adaptive immunity. Now, the immunoglobulin A is a dimer, which is um, the formation of two monomers which join at the FC portion, and immunoglobulin M is referred to as a pentamer because it consists of five monomers which join at the FC portion. We are going to pick all of them one by one and look at what they do. And so immunoglobulin G, as we said, is a monomer. And it is the most abundant antibody isotope or isotype in the blood and plasma, accounting for about 70 to 75% of human immunoglobulins. Now, immunoglobulin G is the only immunoglobulin that can cross the placenta to transfer transient immunity to the fetus and also during the neonatal period. And this protects the infant until it starts to make its own immunoglobulins at about after three months of age. Now, when we look at the functions of immunoglobulin gene, um, we say that it neutralizes microbes and toxins and also pre uh, presents antigens for phagocytosis and also activates the complement system and protects the newborn, as I've just uh, said. Now, because immunoglobulin G is able to cross the placenta, resource antibodies in a resource negative matter can also pass through the placenta to the fetus. And this is important because the anti resource antibodies may attack the fetal red blood cells which carry the antigen. 
And so we may have a potential hemolytic anemia with the risk of hydrops fetalis in this uh, fetus. Now, anytime we have a fourfold rise or four in immunoglobulin gene levels, it indicates that there is an active infection going on. And also, uh, a single positive sample from a patient may indicate a past infection. We are going to look at the sequence of immunoglobulin G and immunoglobulin M response to an infection very soon. So this is immunoglobulin G. The next one is immunoglobulin M. And immunoglobulin M, as we said earlier on, is a pentamer because it has five basic Y-shaped molecules which are linked together and it accounts for about 10% of all immunoglobulins. It circulates in blood and this immunoglobulin cannot cross the placenta. It's usually too large to pass through the placenta and also it cannot be transferred to the infant through breast milk. Now, immunoglobulin M is formed earlier on than any other immunoglobulin, and so it serves as an evidence for recent infection, since it is the first response to uh, you know, contact with antigens. We will look at the specific functions of immunoglobulin M it activates the signaling pathways and also activates the complement system and serves as a marker of recent infection, as we've just said. Now, the presence of immunoglobulin M in a newborn means the newborn is infected with a specific infection. Also, a single positive sample in the serum or cerebrospinal fluid may indicate that there is a recent or an active infection going on. And so uh, if a patient is having hepatitis B infection, you take the sample, you do hepatitis B serology, and you find, and you find immunoglobulin M to hepatitis B virus, it indicates that this patient is having a recent infection and an active infection going on. However, if you find the presence of immunoglobulin G in this same patient or in another patient who is said to have had hepatitis B, the presence of immunoglobulin G may indicate a chronic infection or recovery from the infection. Now, immunoglobulin A, as we said, forms a dimer because we have two monomers which joins at the FC portion. It is abundant in serum, nasal mucus, the saliva, also in the breast milk, as well as intestinal fluid, and account for about 10 to 15% of all human immunoglobulins. Now, the functions of immunoglobulin A is to neutralize microbes and toxins, like any other immunoglobulin, also to protect the gastrointestinal tracts of neonates and can be used as a serodiagnosis of tuberculosis. Also, it can be used in the diagnosis of respiratory syncytial virus. Immunoglobulin D, on the other hand, is a monomer and it forms about less than 1% of all human immunoglobulins and it's always present on the surface of the B lymphocytes. The function of immunoglobulin D is not well known, and so its role in the immune system is not so clear. However, it's present as a membrane receptor and also induction of antibodies or antibody production in the B cells. Finally, we are going to look at immunoglobulin E. And this is also a monomer. It binds to mast cells, causing cross-linking, which may lead to
to the release of histamine when we are exposed to an allergen. And so the immunoglobulin E may bind to basophils and involved in the defense against parasitic infections and also stimulates the release of eosinophils. The immunoglobulin E, its main function is to facilitate the immune response to helminthic infection as well as some parasitic infections. Immunoglobulin E mediates type 1 hypersensitivity reaction and it's used in the serial diagnosis of infectious and non-infectious allergic uh, reactions such as allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. So this is what we have for immunoglobulin E. Now we are going to look at the sequence of response between immunoglobulin M and immunoglobulin G. And so initially, when you are exposed to an infection, immunoglobulin M, as I've said earlier on, is produced as the first response to many antigens. And the levels may remain high transiently and for later on, as we are going to see. Now, after immunoglobulin M has finished its work, immunoglobulin G is produced and we are going to have high levels of immunoglobulin gene persisting in small amounts throughout life. And so immunoglobulin gene, when present, may either indicate a chronic infection or recovery from an infection. So it may also be produced in large amounts during a secondary response to an infection. And it may also persist and also have the memory cell after a primary response to an infection. Now, when you have an infection, during the first stimulus, we have immunoglobulin M shooting up. And as immunoglobulin M protects us from the infection or tries to fight the infection, after some, some weeks, we are going to have immunoglobulin G kicking in even when we have immunoglobulin M still working. So immunoglobulin G goes up above the level of immunoglobulin M, and at this period, we will have a decline in immunoglobulin M as immunoglobulin G takes over the protection of the body. Now, with time, the levels of immunoglobulin G begins to fall, but it doesn't fall completely. It may maintain, or it may be maintained in small amount throughout life. However, whenever there is a secondary uh, you know, uh, infection, we are going to have another response of immunoglobulin gene. And so anytime we have fourfold rise in immunoglobulin gene, like we said before, it may indicate an active infection. And so this is the sequence with which immunoglobulin M and immunoglobulin gene respond anytime we are exposed to an antigen. Now, as we said earlier on, the immune response is supposed to help us defend ourselves against microbes and some cancers. But sometimes the immune system may fail. And when this happens, we are going to have two main phenomena, which we call hypersensitivity reactions and immunodeficiency. And so when we say hypersensitivity reaction, it is when the immune system responds excessively against antigen or to an antigen. And this causes the destruction or the damage of our cells and tissues. And so in essence, hypersensitivity is the overreaction of the body to an infectious agent. There are four main types of hypersensitivity reaction. We have type 1 through to type 4. We are going to look at each of them in a separate video. And so all that I need to I need you to know over here is we have four main types of hypersensitivity reactions. Now, when we say allergy, it is the overreaction of the body to an environmental substance. And when we say autoimmunity, it is rather the overreaction of the immune system to itself. And so we may have lots of autoimmune 
diseases, including systemic lupus erythematosus. Now, immunodeficiency, on the other hand, is when there is loss or inadequate function of the various components of the immune system. And so, uh, we may have uh, deficiency in the barrier system of the immune system, deficiency in phagocytes, B and T lymphocytes, the complement system, and also the natural killer cells. When all of these are unable to perform their duty in protecting us against infection, we say there is an immunodeficiency. And so anytime uh, the immune system fails, then the host becomes at high risk of acquiring various forms of infections. Now, immunodeficiency may be congenital, or which we also call primary. And when we say congenital immunodeficiency, it is always due to a genetic abnormality or when there is a defect in the lymphocyte maturation. An example of this is when we have congenital B and T lymphocyte deficiency, also in conditions such as phagocyte disorders as well as complement defects. But immunodeficiency can also be secondary or acquired. And when we say acquired or secondary immunodeficiency, it is when uh, the immunodeficiency results from infections, also from nutritional deficiencies, some environmental factors, and even treatment can also cause acquired or secondary immunodeficiency. An example of them include acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, which we have in HIV AIDS, chronic leukemia, and also in malnutrition. Now, to sum everything up, what have we learned so far? We said that immunoglobulin A is secreted into mucus, saliva, and tears, and also into the breast milk. And it presents the pathogens for destruction. Immunoglobulin D, we said, um, uses the B-cell receptor and it stimulates the release of immunoglobulin M, but the role is not so much um, uh, known. Then, we said immunoglobulin E binds to mast cells and basophils and is involved in allergic and serves as antiparasitic activity. So it's involved in allergic reactions. Then immunoglobulin G binds to phagocytes and is the main blood antibody for secondary responses and it is the only immunoglobulin which crosses the placenta to the fetus. And finally we said immunoglobulin M rather fixes the complement, and it's the main antibody of primary response. It uses the B-cell receptor and also has a memory for the immune system. So this is all that I have for you. Thank you.